Sure, it's my pleasure to be here. I'm uh, a former PISMIP member and panel co-chair. I don't actually remember when that was, but it was like a decade ago. Uh, so I'm happy to be back with PISMIP uh, telling you about S mode. So S mode is, it stands for sub mesoscale ocean dynamics experiment. And it's definitely a process study. Uh, and let's, let's go ahead and I'll tell you about it. Uh, there's actually, uh, a lot of moving parts in S mode and I'll barely scratch the surface in this presentation, but I hope to give you an overview and, uh, tell you what's unique about it. So this is an outline for the presentation. I'll talk about the very briefly about the scientific motivation, then about some of the enabling technology and then the experimental design, which is focused on vertical velocity and gradients of horizontal velocity in the ocean. And then a preview of some early results. So for the last few decades, it's become increasingly clear that as we increase the horizontal resolution of ocean models, we have a, an explosion of kilometer scale variability and development of really sharp temperature gradients and density gradients in the surface ocean that are really as sharp as the model grid can represent. <clears throat> and this figure is showing a, a plot from what is now a classic paper by Capé et al., uh, part of a, a three paper series that they wrote on uh, some mesoscale ocean variability. And uh, th the models have really outpaced our ability to observe the ocean and uh, but what is clear is that the submesoscale eddies have a net effect in these ocean models. They affect the horizontal and vertical structure on larger scales because they have a net transport, a, a sort of turbulent transport. And <clears throat> uh, people are especially interested in the effect of submesoscale eddies on vertical transport in the ocean surface layer because the submesoscale eddies are strong there. Uh, vertical transports are uh, generally weak in the ocean, but uh, submesoscale eddies can have very large vertical velocities and uh, can transport, uh, can sort of communicate between the deeper ocean and the atmosphere. Uh, so, we believe that some mesoscale eddies have important horizontal and vertical transports that affect larger scales on the basis of numerical simulations, uh, but those simulations are quantitatively questionable. And it's really because the link scales of the sub mesoscale variability are uh, starting to overlap scales that are parameterized in the models, uh, you know, where it sub-kilometer scale uh, for a lot of the most energetic uh, submesoscale variability. And a lot of the action is occurring very close to the model grid resolution. So that's a, a dangerous space for numerical solutions. So uh, I'm the principal investigator of S mode, but uh, me and a large team of people developed uh, a sort of underlying hypothesis or motivating hypothesis and a set of science objectives for S mode. And it's really to test the hypothesis that 
some mesoscale ocean eddies make important contributions to vertical exchange in the upper ocean. Uh, and we laid out a series of four hypotheses that go from, or objectives rather, that go from e easiest on the top to most difficult on the bottom. And this bottom one I really want to highlight. Our goal is to get at the vertical transport due to submesoscales in the ocean. Uh, this involves measuring the vertical velocity, which is really uh, notoriously difficult. Even very large vertical velocities in the ocean are less than a centimeter per second or on the order of a centimeter per second for extreme values. And this is really difficult to measure directly with things like current meters and uh, it's been a challenge, a long-standing challenge in oceanography. So, uh, the the sort of field campaign that we envisioned uh, is involves a, a huge number of assets, and this was made possible because uh, S mode is funded as a NASA Earth Venture suborbital mission. Uh, which means that we have $30 million for a five-year effort. And uh, the plan is to have three aircraft with remote sensing measurements of uh, surface currents on two of the aircraft, which I'll, I'll tell you more about. Uh, so one aircraft carries a Doppler scatterometer and an infrared imager. Uh, that's a NASA King Air B-200. Then a second aircraft carries the Scripps uh, mass sensor suite, uh, which is multi-parameter, hyperspectral, infrared, visible, and uh, a LIDAR uh, sea surface height measurement. Uh, and then the third aircraft is a Gulfstream aircraft that will carry the PRISM hyperspectral imager, uh, which is a really uh, sort of state-of-the-art hyperspectral imager uh, that has really advanced capabilities for ocean biology uh, sort of measurements. Uh, and then we have a fleet of autonomous vehicles uh, sort of more than two dozen autonomous vehicles are in the mix. Uh, we have subsurface gliders, wave gliders. Uh, we had sail drones in the first two campaigns and uh, about a hundred surface drifters for our plan for our final campaign. And we have had a research vessel. Uh, there are are three campaigns uh, for S mode. Two have already been conducted, and the third one is just getting underway. The the final campaign. <clears throat> so, uh, why are we doing this now? Well, it's a combination of factors. One is that. Uh, recent advances with in situ platforms like the autonomous vehicles that I was showing you and uh, pretty substantial improvements in acoustic Doppler current profilers or ADCPs that we use to measure velocity do allow measurement of vertical velocity and, and improved measurements of horizontal velocities. <clears throat> And, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, aircraft remote sensing measurements are uh, now enable measurements of surface currents uh, by different means. <clears throat> so, uh, first I'll talk about the, the first of those two developments. Several 
innovations in in C2 platforms have uh, helped us out here. It's now possible to have uh, massive arrays of GPS track surface drifters. Uh, acoustic Doppler current profilers have improved uh, partly because of improvements in accelerometers and inertial motion units that let us more precisely know the orientation of the ADCPs, but also because of improvements in the electronics that have been enabled by uh, expiration of, of patents that were uh, making it so that only one manufacturer could, could use the uh, sort of most robust um, method of signal processing. Uh, and then there have been continuous improvements in autonomous platforms and the development of water following Lagrangian floats, uh, which allow direct measurements of vertical velocity. Here's an example of that. Uh, last point, uh, these Lagrangian floats have been developed over the last few decades, uh, led by Eric DeSaro. And here we're looking at uh, data from an experiment in the Gulf of Mexico, but the float was deployed uh, here at the STAR. Uh, this is a plan view in panel A, was de deployed at the STAR, and then it subducted, it came along in this sea surface temperature front and subducted uh, underneath the front. This is, I guess this is actually surface density we're looking at uh, in the map. Uh, it subducted and here you can see a depth time view of that process. So here's the triangle where, where it subducted or where it was uh, on the surface at the square it subducted I went down, uh, this is the vertical velocity measured by the float. So the, the float uh, has one of these uh, newer, more advanced ADCPs, and it measured vertical velocities of a couple of centimeters per second uh, downward as it was swept down and then upward as it came back to the surface. Uh, So the other major innovation has been with aircraft remote sensing, and there are two uh, remote sensing techniques that I will tell you about. Uh, but part of our, our basic approach here to getting at vertical velocities is to measure horizontal velocities, and then from the convergence and divergence of the horizontal velocities, estimate the vertical velocity uh, through the uh, incompressibility equation. Uh, so if the water comes together at the surface, that means it must be going down. <clears throat> and we can do, <clears throat> do that kind of estimate, both with arrays of autonomous vehicles, which can get the vertical profile of velocity and its divergence, and from aircraft remote sensing, which only measures at the surface. So for the autonomous platforms, uh, here I'm showing an example of, of one kind that we're using heavily in S mode. Uh, these are wave gliders. They're propelled by the surface waves. And between Huey and Scripps, we fielded nine of these uh, for S mode. And so we can have an array and each one carries ADCPs uh, looking down, a really nice uh, GPS IMUs so that we can motion correct the velocity measurements and, and precisely orient the ADCP. Uh, and we have ADCPs looking up from this, the sub, we call it, the, which is where the propulsion happens. Uh, the the wave the action of the waves drives this thing forward by uh, basically creating relative motion vertical motion at the sub that gets 
uh, translated into a horizontal motion by these fins. Uh, and we've actually done a lot of work in S mode to try to validate these ADCP measurements. And that's one of the, the major uh, results of S mode is that we've uh, done extensive comparisons between different kinds of ADCP measurements and different kinds of uh, velocity measurements to better understand the accuracy of the different platforms. Um, so our basic strategy with the NC2 assets is to operate these in arrays to infer divergence and or measure, estimate divergence and infer vertical velocity. Uh, and then we have aircraft getting us the bigger picture. So I'll, I'll talk quickly about the two uh, main types of remote sensing measurements of surface currents. Uh, one is the JPL instrument Doppler scat. It's a KA band Doppler scatterometer. Uh, and this is uh, a method that could be employed in space on a, on a, a satellite instrument. Uh, and so that's of a lot of interest uh, to the physical oceanographic community. Um, the other aircraft it, instrument is the Scripps Modular Aerial Sensing System. Uh, it has a lot of instruments, but uh, by a visible imagery uh, video techniques, it can estimate the surface currents from the Doppler shift of the surface wave field. I'll say a bit more about how each of these work. So here's a picture of Doppler scat. It's a, a rather small radar. It's a KA band uh, Doppler radar. And so the it has a rotating antenna inside this radome. Uh, Dragana Perkovic Martin, an engineer at JPL, is the principal investigator. And Ernesto Rodriguez is the science lead for that instrument. Uh, and so Doppler scat is measuring the speed of kind of five millimeter wavelength uh, gravity capillary waves on the sea surface. And there's a lot, uh, a lot of physics that uh, goes into relating these gravity, the speed of these gravity capillary waves to the speed of the ocean currents, but to really severely gloss over a lot of that. Uh, it's, it's sort of a combination of the speed of propagation of these waves themselves, which uh, we know really well. Uh, the radar really only responds to a, a single wavelength of waves, so we can estimate their propagation speed from the dispersion relation. Uh, but there is a lot of subtlety I don't have time to talk about there. Then there are modulations of these waves by the larger scale wave velocity. Uh, and that, uh, loosely speaking, averages out over space. And then the residual of these is going to be the uh, surface current that we want. Uh, so these waves are sort of propagating on top of a moving ocean. Uh, Ernesto Rodriguez and the Doppler SCAT team have done a lot of work to validate the measurement, and I'll show you some uh, results. It really works uh, impressively well. So this is a, a scanning radar. So the, the radar beam is rotating as the aircraft flies along. And the idea is to uh, look at the velocity, the radial velocity of the sea surface at from different directions as the aircraft passes over. Uh, and so we can do that really well at the kind of sweet spot where we can see a spot from uh, 
right angles, uh, we can't do it as well at the outer edge of the swath or in the center of the swath. It's harder to get a good uh, vector velocity. Okay, and now the mass instrument, it works by a very different principle. So here's a video as uh, we fly along or as the mass aircraft flies along and each of these boxes, you can see that there's some uh, time spent on each of the uh, each of the boxes. In other words, the camera is seeing a spot on the ground for uh, for several seconds. So the idea there is to here's a video from one of those boxes. Uh, so the idea there is that we can do a, a Fourier transform of of this video and see the the dispersion properties of the waves and then uh, by looking at the shift of those dispersion curves from the theoretically expected dispersion curves, we can estimate what the ocean currents must be. Uh, that is a, a really sound physical principle and the mass, uh, Luke Linane is the PI on this and he's calling that instrument dot viz. Uh, here's an example of the data from dot viz in uh, our pilot campaign. And it uh, produces very low noise, uh, stable estimates of the velocity with very high spatial resolution, like hundreds of meters. Um, so, now, our sampling strategy is to focus on velocity gradients, uh, vertical vorticity and horizontal divergence, and to infer vertical velocity. Uh, here is an example from, of our activities from the pilot campaign that we just conducted last fall. Uh, right now, you're seeing autonomous vehicles, uh, and every once in a while, we get a good sea surface temperature image. Now we're doing flights. The green, fast-moving thing is the ship, uh, and we kind of honed in on this very strong front, and I'll show you some results of the measurements there. Uh, the front went unstable and we were really excited about what we observed. Okay. So here is an SST image uh, from uh, infrared satellite instrument and the arrows are estimates of the surface currents from satellite altimetry. Uh, the black polygon is is the S mode operations area just west of San Francisco. Uh, I'll zoom in on this box. So here's a, a zoom in on that smaller area. Here I've indicated 10 kilometers for scale. And there was this uh, big mesoscale uh, strain field that's driving this cold water toward this warm water and creating a really sharp front. And then the front is becoming unstable as we move downstream. So here we see the sharp front and the development of some mesoscale instabilities along the front. Here's another image about eight hours later. Uh, so it's gone from daytime to nighttime. So the SSTs got a bit cooler, but you can also see that these instabilities are uh, have gotten a bit more uh, wiggly. And here is the SST that we observed from one of the aircraft the next day, about 12 hours later, and you can see these like really beautiful breaking waves in the SST. Here's the velocity from Doppler scat, uh, it's all red because the, 
the flow is to the east here, uh, as you could tell from the satellite altimetry. Uh, and it's reaching about a meter per second, but what's more interesting is these spatial variations at the scale of the instability. Uh, we can high pass filter the Doppler scat velocity and that's what the white lines are. These are streamlines of the high pass filtered current. I'll zoom in on that. So now we're looking at SST measure from the aircraft and the streamlines of high pass filtered ocean velocity from Doppler scat. Uh, and you can see really a strong correspondence between the these instabilities and the the currents measured by Doppler scat and we have some like tight eddies that develop. We also have uh, a bunch of in situ assets in the field here, including arrays of sail drones. There are four sail drones in a kind of kilometer scale array and uh, like eight wave gliders in uh, two kilometer scale arrays. We also have gliders, Lagrange on floats, uh, the research vessel, Bold Horizon. Here is the vorticity computed from the Doppler scat velocity data. And uh, this is, is really, really exciting because we've never had a, an observational picture of ocean vorticity like this uh, in the open ocean. And we have uh, ground truth from arrays of in situ measurements. So I want to just pause for a minute to talk about why the why it's so exciting to have these measurements of vorticity. Uh, for my whole career, uh, I've been seeing ocean modelers show plots like this one on the left of ocean vorticity. Here it's normalized by F, the Coriolis frequency. Uh, and modelers show this because it's a dynamically important quantity and it's, uh, you know, visually interesting for sure. But the model simulations are not really well constrained. Uh, to illustrate that point, here's the same model with uh, model resolution increasing by a factor of four uh, in each panel or three, I don't, yeah, a factor of about three in each panel. So we go from four kilometer grid to 1.5 to 0.5 and you can see that it, not only are the details changing, it's changing qualitatively. Uh, but it's exciting because we can finally make observational pictures uh, of these quantities. And I want to just step back to like the state of the art before S mode, uh, which I think is well represented by the Latmix program where they, they drove two research vessels parallel to each other uh, for like 500 kilometers. Uh, that, you know, probably cost uh, uh, close to a million dollars just for that uh, five days of time with two ships. Uh, they drove next to each other a kilometer apart and then using the frozen field approximation along their track, you could estimate the, you know, two components of the velocity gradient and then they computed statistics of vorticity and divergence that could be compared to numerical models. Uh, S-mode is really taking us really far beyond this, uh, where we can have, you know, pictures of the vorticity and divergence. And just to kind of now put that uh, S-mode observations into context, here I'm showing the S mode measured vorticity kind of plopped down on this high resolution numerical model simulation. Uh, the science team is really excited about this uh, and 
we've been describing it with all sorts of uh, superlatives. So I'm wrapping up now. We're we're starting our final campaign, and I want to point out that uh, SWAT the new SWATH satellite altimeter is up in orbit. It's collecting really wonderful data. And right now it's on a, a one day fast repeat orbit. Uh, it's not an accident that this big NASA program S mode is taking place in the, the CalVal region of the SWAT satellite. Uh, so our uh, operations area from last fall is here. We're ex expanding, oops, expanding this operations area to the south to also include more of this uh, crossover of the SWAT fast repeat orbit. Uh, but we're really looking forward to getting uh, the S mode and SWAT observations together uh, this spring. Uh, finally, I want to point out that all the data are publicly available. Uh, NASA requires that we uh, publish the data to an archive within about six months of collection. Uh, we're also holding a series of open data workshops. Uh, we want people to use the data, and we're uh, sort of going on the road to explain the instruments and how to use the data. Uh, okay. So that is uh, all I wanted to present. I'll I yield for questions now. All right, well, thank you. Virtual round of applause. Um, Thanks, Tom. Great, so I think at this point, let me look. I didn't see, yeah, so we can, uh, I think we can just open up the floor for for questions. So if people want to pop their hand up in the chat, um, that's probably the easiest way to triage things. So I guess, I mean, I'll, I'll kick things off because um, I just had one little, well, I have a few little questions, but uh, being one of the modelers on PISMIP, um, <clears throat> you showed some you know, I mean, this is always the, I'm an atmospheric modeler, but it's the same deal. You know, you push the resolution, you make these awesome, you know, um, movies that you can then go show at an AGU town hall or, or something like that. So this is, you know, really exciting to me to have the kind of, you know, some of that, that ground truth information. Mike, um, do you know if there are plans? Um, so you, you kind of like overlaid on top of a model simulation some of those vorticity maps that you had made. Are there also plans um, either directly as part of S-Mode or in collaboration with S-Mode to, I don't know, run hindcasts or do something to help kind of bridge um, directly the observations or kind of are there thoughts on what the plans are for that? Uh, yes, so I think it's probably my first backup site because having been on PISMIP, uh, I expected, you know, <laughs> questions about this. Uh, so we do have several modeling groups involved, uh, and we're, you know, we want to make it easy to use the data. All the data sets are being put out as net CDF data with sort of supporting, you know, Python notebooks showing how to how to access and use the data. Uh, but right now, uh, NRL is running in a forecast model, actually. So they're assimilating all the observations that they can and running a forecast model. And that has been working impressively well. Uh, I probably have a backup slide that, that shows, but we're using that. Like when we chose that front to go to, we were looking at the NRL forecast it wasn't perfect, but there was a front in more or less the right place that was unstable in the uh, NRL forecast. Uh, I'm sure, you know, everyone has heard of the uh, famous high resolution JPL run of the MIT GCM, uh, and they are well integrated into our science team and uh, 
you know, we were certainly looking at that model when we were thinking about how to sample the ocean and uh, and we're we're working really closely. There's a lot of uh, connection and overlap between the JPL Doppler SCAT team and the JPL modeling team. Uh, the UCLA ROMS group is, you know, part of the science team and Jacob Winograd is, uh, who's been doing LES simulations is part of the team. Uh, that said, we do hope to go back and make a real state estimate. Uh, there's a lot of data here and uh, not all of it is is assimilated now. I'd be really happy to have uh, advice on how to connect with modeling groups. Awesome, yeah, uh, great. I, the, I, I like that this was the first backup slide there, um, kind of prepared for, for that question to pop up. And uh, yeah. Um, all right, uh, Antionetta, I think that's a hand, right? Yes, yes it is. yeah, and I think I'm mute. I'm, uh, yeah, I'm not muted, so I can speak. Thank you so much, Tom. This was uh, really fascinating. It's incredible to see all these diff difficult quantities to measure that now are actually being uh, detected with all these uh, uh, various instruments. So um, one point that you have emphasized at the beginning is the, the ability to measure vertical velocities. And, uh, and if I'm not mistaken, I think one of your sensors or uh, also had uh, something to make um, at instruments also for biology. So I was wondering if you are planning um, to use some of your measurement to look maybe at the effect of these uh, um, high resolution fields on uh, upwelling of quantities that are relevant for uh, biological processes, for example. And the other thing is uh, uh, to what degree you are going to look at the Earth interactions at these scales. Thanks for asking. Uh, both of those are uh, major interests in S mode. Uh, so we have the prism hyperspectral imager, which is, you know, it can do ocean color, but that's like, not even interesting to the PRISM uh, team, you know, because they can discriminate species of plankton and, and things like it's a really, really, uh, you know, advanced hyperspectral imager. Uh, we also have hyperspectral measurements from uh, mass and uh, of course, satellite measurements. And we have uh, a, a lot of, in water bio optics. Uh, and that's definitely of interest. It's of interest partly as another tracer and partly, you know, to sort of uh, poke at some of these longstanding questions about, you know, the patterns that, that we see in measurements of chlorophyll from high resolution satellite. Uh, you know, those could be just stirring or upwelling or all sorts of uh, phenomena could be involved. Uh, I wanted, I pulled up this slide because I wanted, you know, we are cross comparing these different kinds of measurements and we think that we, we can do a credible job of estimating vertical fluxes from the aircraft measurements. And just to show that, here's a, a really big zoom in on the aircraft SST. And uh, this is convergence and divergence estimated from Doppler SCAT. So you see cold water and convergence, warm water and divergence. So the, the warm water is spreading out, the cold water is, is going down. Uh, that's a vertical flux. And we did coincident measurements with the Lagrangian floats that, you know, got, and the drifters got pulled into this strong convergence. Uh, 
there's a lot of work to do to get quantitative, but we're really encouraged by these early results. I mean, these data are from uh, four months ago. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, uh, here's an, just an, a sample of uh, prism chlorophyll, but it they produce like much more amazing pictures. Uh, this was like very, very early, like day of the flight, quick look uh, data. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's really beautiful. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you, for, you thank you for the very interesting uh, talk. Um, I guess I, I have a question about how do you connect this to the parameterization development? Do you have a plan, for, for example, generate some kind of for uh, uh, I some kind of data for driving the oceans, let's say single column model to uh, check their parameterization, like I don't know how how non-local is the vertical mixing is uh, for this uh, some meso uh, mixing. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if there is a plan to, to you know basically simplify the data so that people can use that for example for single column ocean model parameterization and also how representative the measurable as a measured region um, if people want to develop something you know, more general for some uh, those, yeah. those are really good questions. I guess the way I'm looking at it is that, uh, well, two things. We're not, we're not trying to tackle any parameterization here. We're trying to make, expand our, uh, you know, uh, observational capability and and one of our explicit goals is to collect data that can be used to test statistics in models uh, so you know uh, like I showed this picture of uh, vorticity getting stronger and stronger but uh, you know these are pretty well resolved uh, sort of kilometer scale resolution estimates of vorticity. And, uh, you know, the idea is that uh, you can use things like uh, probability distributions of vorticity and divergence to start to understand whether the models are, are striking the right balance at their shortest resolve scales. Uh, how is it representative? That's a totally fair question. I mean, the, the statistics of these kinds of quantities are really hard, you know, and, and like we went and measured this tiny patch uh, because we thought there was a big signal there. And if we'd gone, you know, over somewhere else, it would have been quite different. So maybe partly the legacy of S mode will be uh, advancing the ways that we can collect measurements of these things. Thank you. Um, you know, rather than just the data set. Thank you. Patrick? Uh, Patrick? Yeah. Uh, so let me kind of give a little bit of background behind this, but it actually, this follow my question follows on really well from where you left off with Ming. So um, from a PISM perspective, I think uh, there it's, it's important to understand what could the next generation of process study look like, right? You've shown these really great uh, new measurements that, that we can make to understand this ocean sub, sub mesoscale eddies in the ocean and, and their, their role and their influence. So I guess, and, and also, I'm part of the air sea transition zone studies is also we're working on a let's call it a 10 year roadmap of what measurements and what field campaigns do we need to get to over the next decade in order to substantially advance our understanding of the air sea transition zone. 
So with that, those two kind of as a background, I'm curious, like you have this, you have these, this, these measurements now, but now, so what is, what would the science goals and what would the a next step look like in terms of like, let's say an S mode two, or, you know, are there different regions or the different sampling strategies? Where, where do you see, uh, uh, we can go and and potentially propose process studies or otherwise that could really start advance our understanding past where S mode is. What are the key areas and key science? Thanks. Uh, the short answer, in my mind, I think that uh, statistical representativeness uh, would be really nice. You know, I mean, this is really cool, but it's just like one spot where you know that we went to because it looked like something really interesting was happening but uh you could like with the wave glider arrays for example they have a very long endurance they could last for a year uh and we ran them for like 14 days in these triangular arrays and got a time series of vorticity and divergence that's it's super interesting. I've never seen anything like it, uh, but it's a 14 day time series. And if we had been like, you know, 10 kilometers away from there, our statistics would have been totally different. You know, we were just right next to the front. Uh, but so one thing that would be interesting is to do that for a year. Also this idea of trying to get vertical velocity from arrays of autonomous vehicles, uh, could be used to do things like uh, heat budgets to understand the balance of processes setting SST in sort of problem regions. Uh, or you could gather better statistics with long flights of something like Doppler scat, you know, just like cross the ocean basin uh, as opposed to a bunch of short day trips. Thank you. That's very helpful. If you don't uh, mind me asking a super naive follow-up question um, regarding the wave gliders, is um, I, I, I <clears throat> never being involved with a, a field campaign. I was curious. You know, um, we at least when I talk to people in the atmosphere, there's a lot of con well, not concerns, but a lot of hoops to jump through with autonomous sampling of the atmosphere. Is it similar with the ocean, or literally could we take this array of wave gliders and leave it out there for a prolonged period of time or how much, I guess my question is like, how much are there bureaucracy hoops? Or are there other things that would be an Im impediment to something like that? No, uh, not really. I mean, you could really leave it out there. Uh, uh, it, in terms of permitting and stuff like that, it's not a big deal. It's pretty easy. Uh, yeah, a, a couple of people have asked about air sea interaction. There's a major focus in S mode. We're also deploying radio sons uh, with like very fine spatial resolution across these fronts, and uh, Doppler scat measures winds. Uh, the wave gliders and sail drones are all making surface meteorological measurements. Uh, these are uh, wind divergence, wind curl, uh, and current divergence and curl on the right. Anyway, I thought I would put that out there. It's just there's so much happening, you know, it's hard to cram into one talk. All right. I think we're getting toward the top of the hour, so I, I think we'll call this last call if anyone has a, a last question that they'd like to get answered. Um, Mike? I saw, yeah, I saw Mike's hand go up and then go back down, so. Yeah, I don't want to hold up anything since we're going to be wrapping up here. It's very good to see you again, Tom. Um, I guess um, in turn back to this question about how to engage with the modeling groups beyond the ones that you already have have engaged. So I guess a question for the 
for the panel itself, what model, what modeling groups out there are working at these high, especially the modeling centers are working at these kilometric scale model, modeling that could utilize this information or is it necessary or is it more about understanding the processes for prioritization um, development? What's who at what centers would it make sense to um, for NASA and others? I mean, we can bring this back to the interagency group as well to see how it is that we can better um, engage the modeling efforts. So I'm going to open that up to the panel as well. Well, so I will say, you know, there's this big push with both the DOE and to some extent with NSF's modeling efforts, but, but a lot of it I've seen with DOE with um, E3SM and the MPAS ocean model. And they like to show, you know, this idea of regional refinement and being able to push down to kilometer spacing over geographic regions. Um, I could really see there being a nice synergy kind of in terms of process study or you know, information that comes out of this helping, you know, kind of guide the utility of, of such models. So that would be when you were showing a lot of the movies, I had seen a lot. I was like, oh, yeah, this is very much like what the DOE has been showing um, recently with their their MPAS efforts. Yeah, at GFDR, we also have some high resolution ocean and also coupled um, modeling activity. So this will be very useful for those model development, I think. Yeah, I think it can help uh, validate also, um, you know, clear, clearly the, these are stochastic processes, so it's not that you can find a model that reproduce this exact sequence, but the statistics of the, of certain parameters, or like, uh, you know, we were talking about uh, biological fluxes, do the models with that resolution capture what is observed? Um, because I think even at high resolution, there is still some degree of para some parameters that need to be set in the model. And so, um, are we in the right uh, range of values that so, uh, I, yeah, so for sure, I think it seemed to me that in the modeling world, there is a, a, a stronger and stronger uh, push to really move, go to high resolution also because of societal needs. Um, you know, like, and so, um, having this, uh, parallel observation, great observations that can provide a, a term of comparison. I think it's invaluable. Okay. Thanks. Right. Well, I. I think we've hit the top of the hour, so I don't want to keep anyone uh, too much longer. So I, I want to thank Tom again for being willing to come and chat with us and um, giving an excellent an excellent presentation. So um, virtual round of applause uh, again.